let me introduce Brandon Adams, who is on our missions committee, and he has been one of the main contacts, I think, throughout the years with this family, and he's going to do the honors of introducing Natasha. So real quick, so Sheila doesn't shoot me, um, they're going to be passing the buckets for the collection for uh, class today, so be ready for that. Uh, but what a great time to be at Madison. Yesterday was such a glorious day of service in our community where we got to, to love on our community and uh, do things here in the zip code of 37115. Um, Today, we get to honor and hear from uh, Natasha, who uh, I don't know if she remembers or not, but when we traveled over many years ago, when I first met you, it was probably a little less than 15 years ago, she was our translator at UBI and helped me through being really nervous speaking in chapel to the students, and she must have at least told them something interesting because whatever I had to say, they really enjoyed, and I know it wasn't me. So uh, <clears throat> you, you may not remember that, so now we can kind of return the favor a little bit. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I, when I first met Natasha, it was many, many years ago. And at that time, uh, they were in Donetsk. Um, she took us around to a few... Uh, orphanages where we were able to love on and work with them. She took us to a few hospitals where uh, we were able to do the same. And then she helped us get introduced to some of the students, some of which are now also being sponsored by the church here um, and, and still working to this day inside of Ukraine. Um, so it has been a long, long time of getting to know this family. Now, since then, um, I have really gotten to love and appreciate Natasha and her family, and I personally not only view her as a fellow uh, sister in Christ, but I, I see her as my actual sister. And I don't have a sister, but she's my sister. And we have had many conversations uh, over the years and many opportunities to spend time together, and I'm so appreciative for that. And I don't know if you all are aware of it. Um, Sasha, her husband, is still in Ukraine. Uh, he is still ministering to what um, the church members that are still there that were not able to evacuate. Um, he continues to take and get food to those in need and to anyone that he can while he is there. Um, so <clears throat> she's also a very loving mother of two. Her oldest daughter, Toma, uh, if you'll recall, a few years ago was very, very sick. Um, we were able to help her, uh, and she is now a graduated doctor uh, and is uh, <clears throat> and is going to be working with um, in, in the hospitals once she can get registered in Switzerland, which is where she is right now. Uh, her youngest daughter, Toma, is just finishing her freshman Regina? year. Regina? Okay. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Regina okay. Okay. is just finishing her freshman year at Harding um, University in Arkansas, and she is here to go and pick her up and take her back to Poland uh, here in the next uh, few days. So I'm really thrilled that she is here um, from a spiritual standpoint. The best way that I could relay her to you is the character of Esther in the Bible. This is a Christian woman who has not only been removed from her home not once, but twice due to um, Russian oppression and attacks. Um, she is a leader. She is a teacher who has devoted her life to reaching um, those and, and helping raise preachers. Uh, and helping to minister to anyone from youth all the way up to the elderly. Um, just, just a fantastic, fantastic person that I love very deeply. Um, and I'm thrilled for her to be here, and I hope you will enjoy what she has to say. 
And then at the very end, we hope to have a time, if any of you have questions, that you can ask her. So again, I'll turn this over to her, and I'm so thankful that you are here. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. I want to say I'm not a public speaker, I'm a translator. So I always get to just translate what people want to say and I usually don't make my own speeches, so I have my notes. I don't know if I'll ever use them during my speech, but they make me feel a little better. <laughs> like Brendan said, I came to the United States this time to bring my daughter. Uh, at first, the plan was to bring her home to Ukraine. She came here last August as a freshman, and we dreamed, and she dreamed that this summer she'll spend with us in Kyiv. Well, now it's not possible, but at least I'll bring her with me to my temporary home in Poland. That's why I'm in the, in the United States. But here, I'm for a different reason. I knew I want to come to Madison with one main purpose, to say thank you. I don't think you understand to what extent your help, uh, what your help did to us, what, what your help meant to us, uh, what was the power of your help. Um, right now, my country, Ukrainian people, our churches go through the darkest time that we've had in our life, that we've had in the recent history. And um, the feeling that a lot of people have right now, and that's what I tried to say to a few of you yesterday, it feels like you were standing and now you're just falling. You're falling in a deep pit and you, you know, and everything is gone. You don't have anything. So God, through your church, became hands who caught us and who didn't let us fall, who didn't let us fall into pieces. Um, and what was so special about your church, um, sometimes it, that doesn't happen very often, you reached to us. Before we reached to you and said, could you help us? Brandon, on behalf of your congregation, reached to us and said, we know you're struggling, how can we help? And um, I want to say that at a time like this, you really understand what a value church has. Sometimes when it's peace and, you know, we have relatively good life with some struggles, but still, you know, some foundation. When we just live our usual lives, we come to church to worship. We come to Bible classes. We know it's, it's good to have church, but sometimes we almost start treating it as some com com kind of organization. And then we think, oh, if something happens, I'll just leave. And, you know, it's not a big deal. But this is, when the war happened, we really felt that the church became, uh, like it became so evident that it's just a family. Because when something happens in your family, you all rush to help that one who is suffering. So when this happened to us, the church rushed to help us because we are family, because we are part of God's body. And um, so, this, this is just emotional part that I really wanted to share with you and just to say thank you, thank you, thank you for taking our pain so close to your heart and for wanting to help. I there's so much to say, I don't know. I don't want to become political during my speech. You all know what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, I think you all know it's on your news uh, that Russia came and basically invaded you know, our country and trying to destroy our country, trying to destroy Ukrainian nation as a nation. But I'll, I'd rather talk about what happened to us. I, I want to talk about, talk about our story, something we went through. Uh, about two weeks before the war began, there were a lot of news on TV that the war might, you know, come. And uh, that was what the American government was saying. But People in Ukraine were like, surely it cannot happen. You know, surely our life cannot be just, it, it, we are living in the 21st century, we live in Europe, it's just, not imp it, it just impossible, it will not happen. But then we got a phone call from some people that I cannot, you know, share who it was, but they said, we know it's coming for sure. We want your family to leave. 
you know, before it all started, we want your family to leave. You'll have money, we'll take care of you, just get up and leave. It, uh, it was mind-blowing. Uh, and um, Sasha and I just sat down like, what do you do when that happens? What if somebody calls you and say, we'll help you out, the war's coming to your country, but we will help you out. What do you do? Well, we knew we couldn't leave. That goes back to idea of family. Can you imagine having a large family, like 80 people, it's all your family, like your parents, your sisters, your brothers, your children, your grandchildren, and somebody calls you and say, well, the war's coming to your community, but we can help only your family, but you need to leave everybody else. But we want you to go now. We, we just couldn't do this. We just, um, you know, how could we then look in the eyes of those people and say, yes, we can be into safety, but I'm sorry, you have to stay here. You know, you can't leave because they cannot leave. Everybody cannot leave because they all have their families. So we made the decision that we will stay and whatever our people have to go through, we'll just go through. And if we need to help them to leave, we'll be helping them to leave. If we need to stay here and you know, serve during the war, we will stay here you know, in Kyiv and serve people during the war because when atrocities come, when difficult times come, you need people who would help. A lot of Ukrainians started helping the army wherever they are. So that was our decision to stay. But we did talk to our people. We did talk to the church. And we said, this is real. Would you consider leaving? And they're like, no, we are, we are not leaving. We're staying. We're going to fight. We're going to, we'll be here. We have our jobs. Because you couldn't, I mean, all the jobs, all the schools were working. You couldn't just drop, drop all of this. And then on February the 24th, at about four in the morning, we woke up to very loud explosions. I don't know if you've heard, like, real shelling or real bombs coming to your city. I hope none of you heard it, and I hope none of you will hear it in your life. But that's how we woke up. And then we learned that not just Kyiv, but every large city in Ukraine woke up to the same sounds. So it was all at once. They started bombing on the, all the large cities, wherever you had some military bases or military uh, airports or, um, you know, other, other uh, places like that. It, it, they just started shelling. So we woke up and it's like, this is it. It began. I mean, we didn't believe it will begin, but it began. And, um, but at that day, it was bombing in the morning, and then the rest of the day, we, we just heard the news that they started coming towards Kyiv from the north. I don't know if any of you have seen the map of Ukraine, and I'm not much into geography, but I have learned Ukrainian geography over the last two months very well. Now I pretty much know where every city is, where, where every border is, because every day I have to see what's happening, where my friends are, where our churches are, and what hap what's happening in those cities. So the Russian forces starting coming from the north. And everybody believed that within three or four days they will enter Kyiv, that Kyiv will be defeated. And I know Western um, countries believe that because that's what they were pretty open about. And um, that's what some people in Ukraine even believed. I honestly thought this is it. I, I honestly believe that too. I thought, well, we may be under Russian occupation and we just need to see how we can serve even in that case. But then uh, we believe it was, you know, of course, I, I believe a lot of it was uh, our people are just not willing to give in. They're willing to fight. Our government is not willing to give in and God has just came to our help. And we started fighting back because we knew that I listened to Putin when he spoke. He had a big speech after, before the war began, and I listened to it, and it was pretty much, there is no Ukrainian nation. You know, there is no Ukrainian nation. There should be any Ukrainian nation. So that was, that was horrible. 
So, but we stood and um, our, our soldiers were fighting and so the battle continued. So our life went on, of course. You know, the day when the war began on the 24th, we contacted everybody. We gathered together while the city was not, was not bombed at that time. So we called to some people. Some people were able to come and we started giving some help, even some financial help to people in case if somebody wants to leave or somebody will be locked in in their place. Um, they would have some money. We also asked if people want to leave. At that point, nobody wanted to leave. But at the same time, we understood that it's a reality. So the next day, there were more explosions in Kyiv. And that's when our church um, reached out to people and we said, it's really not safe. And if you cannot or do not want to leave, we want to make a safe place for you. I don't know how to explain that, but in Kyiv, we all live in tall apartment, bu apartment buildings, like the building where we live is a 25-story building. Some buildings are taller, some buildings are 30-story buildings, some are 10-story buildings, but all of our church members live in those apartments. And some of the apartment buildings are old, and they're built in such a way that if a missile hits, a whole building can just fall down. But some apartment buildings are newer apartment buildings and they are very steady. So if, even if the missile hits, it just hits a, hits a part of it and the rest of the building is still standing. So we reached to our members and we started to gather that kind of information, like what kind of building you're living in. Because if you, some, most, many of our members lived in those older buildings. So what we did, we prepared a basement under our church, where our church was gathering, because it was a good building. So we, thankfully, we rented a basement. So we put something like, well, it, it, it's a basement that we use as storage. So there's a lot of stuff there. But we try to put mattresses there. We made something like bunk beds. And we had about 20 people move into the basement because, if, you know, in those older apartment buildings, if something were to happen, they had no, ch they, they had no uh, chance to survive. So about the third day of war, we already had a group of over 20 people living in the church facility and spending night in, in the basement. So that's, you know, those are things we started doing because we, we you know, we didn't know what else to do. But then on the 2nd and 3rd of March, the explosions came very close to where the church was and where we live. And that's where we started urging our people to evacuate, women and children especially. And finally, we had our first exodus, I would call it like this. Um, like around the 4th of March, we were able to get about 10 people mostly women, uh, mostly younger women who, who didn't have children, they were, say, oh, they were saying, okay, we will leave, we will go. So, and Toma was one of them. So they left about 10 women and children. But then the next morning, the next night, the night was so bad, the explosions were so close to us that Sasha and I we didn't sleep all night and we were praying, we were, asking for God's wisdom on all of this. And um, like, we need to take those people out, uh, away. We need to take them to safety. We still had so many children left, teens and elderly ladies who, you know, those people who don't want to move because it's hard to move when you have children or when you're elderly. I mean, you want to stay home. So we started calling or sending messages to everybody around four or five in the morning. Like, we will arrange a big, you know, group to leave today, please go, we urge you to go. But some people were saying, Natasha, are you coming? And I was like, well, my children are grown, I'll stay with my husband. And they're like, if you're not going, we're not going. So because, you know, sometimes people look up to you, they think you know better. So they think, oh, if she's staying, it's gonna be okay. And Sasha's like, Natasha, you need to go. They will not go if you don't go. So I, was, I had to basically, we came, we made a meeting. We all met at church at six o'clock that morning and you know, we decided we we're going to go. So I took about 15 people with me, like women and children, and we headed toward Poland. So at this point, 
Thankfully, several weeks ago, Russian troops pulled away from Kyiv. They were not successful there. And even though there were tanks, Russian tanks, that entered Kyiv from the northern side, you know, you know they were completely defeated there. So now Kyiv is more safer, is, is safer than it was in March, but there's still missile attacks. They still can attack us from the distance. Just several days ago, some missiles hit Kyiv. But Kyiv is a city of four million people and only two million evacuated. So two million people are still in Kyiv. So it, it's not a, you know, um, empty city. That's a city that still, you know, people go to work. I mean, there's still jobs there. And now more and more jobs are opening because it's been two months. People need to make living. People want to stay home. And even though we moved a lot of people from Kyiv, some church members still stayed. And Sasha stayed. And the point of staying, well, some members, we have no control over them, but the point of, you know, Sasha staying there, like, they will need men. I'm a man. I need to help. I mean, I'm a preacher, but I'm also a man, so if they need my help, I want to help, but also I want to preach. I want, to be, I want people in the midst of the darkest time see the risk church, because that's when the time is the worst, some people may turn to God for help. So we don't want them to come, and there is no church there. You know, so, so right now, we have, we've had two baptisms. Uh, it, when people lived in the basement, two, some of them were Christians, some of them were neighbors or family members. So we had two uh, baptisms, and now we have a man uh, who is a neighbor who's been coming to church regularly uh, in Kiev. There's, uh, there are services, uh, there are not too many people there. They have about 10, 15 people meeting, but some of them are new people. Some of them are Christians who left church several years ago and now are coming back but they stayed in Kyiv, and now they're coming back. So that's what we do in Kyiv, along with buying groceries, because a lot of people cannot go anywhere. A lot of people lost their jobs, so the church there, it's, it's a small group, but they're there, they're teaching, they're preaching, they're evangelizing, they're getting groceries for the needy. Our second group, of our churches right now in the Western Ukraine. Because for our exodus to happen, we needed somebody to take us to the, west, the, to the border. And those three of our men drove us in cars. I mean, like we had three car, or four cars and about like about 20 people in those cars. So it was packed. Uh, but they drove us to the Polish border and then they stayed in the Western Ukraine. So they are our team that's helping people who run from war, they take them to the border. Because you can often come on the train to some cities of the Western Ukraine, but it's very hard to get to the border, to cross. So they bring them to the border. And well, Polish borders, it's all official there. There are no illegal immigrants there. We're coming there through Polish you know, um, guards. So it's a special procedure for refugees but it's done very orderly, just a lot of people. And also that group in Western Ukraine, they, there are a huge number of refugee camps in Western Ukraine right now, so they're taking, they're buying food and taking it to them. So kind of like we have now that team also. And then another, the biggest part of our church is in Poland right now, because most women and uh, children are there. We Years ago, when uh, we ran, f when we had to flee Donetsk and became refugees in Kyiv, we began a ministry to the same refugees as we were. And we were contacted by the church in Sopot, Poland. They said, how can we help? And they sent some teddy bears for the children of the refugees because they had in a program of that some kind, so they sent it. And that was our contact with the church, our only contact with the church. We didn't know them before. But then we stayed in contact, and so when we needed to go somewhere, we thought of that church. So we contacted them, and we like, we're refugees again. Are you going to help us? And they said yes. And now we're working together. We, like UBI and um, me personally, very involved in 
coordinating Christians from Ukraine going to Sopot. And the church, local church there, helps us with everything that needs to be done on their end for that to become, poss become possible. It's not just our congregation. We help Christians from other congregations to come and stay there. Now we, ha we have over 90 people, e either uh, church members or their family members, staying in Sopot. And the, we continue to help them. You know, some of them are trying to, I mean, they're trying to learn language, they're trying to find a job, but, you know, but over 150 people altogether went through SOPAD because some people need to go somewhere before they go somewhere else because we are contacting churches in other European countries asking if they could receive more refugees because the number is huge. So that's what we're doing in SOPAD and that's where I'm planning to go back and bring Regina there to continue to serve because just recently we had a, almost 30 people joined us from Mariupol. The cities was well, that was completely destroyed. That the group uh, who stayed in the basement for 50 days without water, electricity, uh, cell phone, nothing. They had nothing. They didn't take a bath for 50 days because the only water they had, they had to save to drink like less than a cup of water every day. So they just recently joined us there. And unfortunately, the war continues and more and more cities are being destroyed, more and more people are running and trying to find refuge either in other parts of Ukraine or in Poland or in other countries. So that's what we're doing and that's what you're doing. You're involved in all of those ministries through your giving. This is the time of life for me where I cannot make any plans because I don't know what happens tomorrow. I mean, you, literally, you don't know if you'll have a country to go back to, you don't know, not even know if you have your home to go back to. I don't know if I'll have my country. I believe in the victor of our country. I believe with all my heart. I believe God will make it possible. I just don't know when, and I don't know how long it'll take. But this is my biggest dream. This is my biggest plan is to go back home, to go back to Ukraine to return to my country and to serve there, continue to serve people that I love so much. But another dream would be, maybe after some time, to be able to come here and say, hey, welcome, come to Kyiv, it's a great country, we're rebuilding it together. So we are very thankful, not just to you, our brothers and sisters, we're thankful to your country, we're thankful to your nation for everything that you're doing for us. And we hope the victory will come soon and God will help us. Thank you very much. And if Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. We've got some mics rolling, so if you would stand up with your question, we can see you, and we'll be glad to get to you. Got one over here. What type of help do you, excuse me, what type of help do you need now? I'm sorry, I, could you? I, Certainly. Mm -hmm. What type of help can we give to you now? What type of help? Oh, uh, uh, you can basically, there is no way to send anything to Ukraine right now. So you've helped us with, you've helped us to purchase a van for our Western Ukrainian group that's taken people to the border. And I want to say that that van was very instrumental of bringing Mariupol group to Sopot. So we're using it in many ways. You've helped us with funds that we've used to buy humanitarian help to the refugee camps and to people in Kyiv. So if you, can, if you want to continue to help in those programs, the thing is we don't know how long it will last. You know, if it was a one-time thing, we would say, well, this is great, thank you for your donation. It just right now, like as long as you can help us with those, as long as the war continues, and unfortunately, even when the war ends, we'll probably still have a lot of needs. So as long as you're, you can be with us in those needs, that would be something of a great help. Hey, Natasha. Immigration is a very hot topic in this country, and you mentioned being finding yourself 
the Ukrainian people as refugees. And so my question is, what, what are the Ukrainian people's attitude toward Poland and other countries that are receiving them with open and loving arms as immigrants and refugees? Uh, what, let me uh, ask if I understood you right. Like how Ukrainians, what the attitude of Ukrainians to the countries who received them, like Poland, okay. Well, we are absolutely smitten by their love, especially Poland. When we came into Poland, we were in, you know, the, um, you cross the Polish border, we were walking. I mean, we, had, we stood in line for five hours in cold with like hundreds and hundreds of other people. So, and we stood at the border that usually don't let people cross who are walking. It was only for cars. But Poland didn't care. Like if you're from Ukraine, come in. If you don't have the right papers, come in. If you have dogs without passports, bring them in. We'll, we'll help you any way you, we can help you. So it was mind blowing. And then we came in and they were like volunteers. Nobody pays them or anything. They brought their personal cars, buses, and they're like, where do you need to go? We'll take you to this refugee place where you could spend a night and then we'll take you where you need to go. And if you don't have a place where you need to go, we'll just find you someplace. And there would be people on the streets, elderly, I just remember while well, elderly man just had some apples from his garden and he just brought it into our bus and you know, who wants apples? We just absolutely, we never felt such closeness with Poland as now. I know other countries are helping too. Uh, Toma is in Switzerland because uh, a church in Zurich said we can receive some refugees and she speaks German. In Switzerland, in Switzerland she can in a couple of years work as a doctor. If she, I mean, if she goes through some, author, you know, she's doing some paperwork with her diploma, then she can work as an intern doctor in a couple of years as a doctor. So the church has opened the doors and we are eternally grateful. So they're, you're doing what you can do, they're doing what they can do, and together, let me tell you, the Christians are taken care of, well, all the people are taken care of, but not as much as the Christians, because we know a lot of people are returning to Ukraine from Poland and other countries, because financially, it's still a struggle. But the churches completely took care of, of, of the brothers and sisters, and that's where a lot of relatives of the Christians now come to church and being baptized because they see the difference. They value the church now. Before they couldn't understand why would their relatives go to church? Why do you need church? Well, now they know. <laughs> now they know because they get the blessings. They get the blessings of, of being, you know, in the household of somebody who's with the church. And we do have baptisms of several relatives who are like, yes, that's, you know, I, I thought, well, they all said, oh, we believe in God, we just don't come to church. Well, now they want to be a part of the church and they went through, you know, they know under, now understand what, it, what it's, how to be saved and, you know, so it, it's, yes, but we love the countries who are accepting us. I had a question. Um, number one, I think you're a excellent public speaker. Thank you. Number two, I think I speak for all of us, we are all smitten with you. <laughs> Thank you. I wondered if you could explain the language situation with, we have all our states connected here and we have accents, but we have basically the same language. When you go to Poland, I know there's so many different languages, are they able to get jobs? Do they have a common way to communicate in every direction? Mm -hmm. So the language, the language issue is difficult because in Ukraine, a lot of people spoke Russian, some were spoke Ukrainian, will come to Poland and it's a Polish language. Unfortunately, even though it's similar to Ukrainian, it's very, very difficult. So for people to really start getting some good jobs, they need to learn it. It will take probably several months of extensive study. We can understand a lot, but we can't really communicate. So that's one of the drawbacks. You have to study the language to get a job. And so, of course, some of our refugees are really hoping, like me, the su in the summer war will be over and we'll go back. But, you know, but if that doesn't happen, you know, you need to study the language. So they'll, they'll be studying the language. It, it's, it's different, it's very different. 
I mean, it's similar, but still different enough that we can't communicate. Natasha, I can't believe you can speak English like you do. <laughs> I've, read, I've read your story, how you learned it. Very interesting, mm -hmm. the way you learned English, but you speak it beautifully. Well, thank you. In fact, some Americans could take some lessons from you. <laughs> but I want you to know that in this church, there are people who have wept for you. I cannot. I've tried to get there in my mind. I can't. But I, I can't fathom what it's like. I've just thought about, all right, tomorrow I leave the United States. I don't have anything to go back to for however long. I just cannot imagine. And my heart breaks for you. Thank you. I am so sad. You're very, very strong. Uh, we, we pray for you. Every day we pray for you. And thank you for coming here. Thank you for standing and talking to us. And thank you for that beautiful English. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Your prayers do wonders. Prayers do wonders. Well, Natasha, thank you so much for being willing to do this. I know that that can be very uncomfortable, and you did a fabulous, fabulous job. Thank you. You were all very good to me. Thank you. One thing I, I would like to add to that is not only has have, have uh, you as a congregation, as us as a church, been very generous in helping them. I want you to know how well they are doing from a stewardship standpoint of using the funds to the max benefit of all that need it. Um, I'll give an example. You mentioned how where Bogdan was. He, we sent him some funds and he wanted to help some orphans that had been turned out from the orphanage and they had nowhere to go. He wanted to help them, but he told me, he said, I don't want to give them money lest they be tempted to use it in the wrong means. I want to use it for food and give it to them so that they can specifically have what they need. So I know that it's being spent and used wisely, and we're so thankful for that. And Sheila mentioned to me, just to remind everybody, that this is an ongoing thing, and we are committed to helping you however we can. Thank you. And you can continue to give if you like online. If you would like to find Sheila um, at any time and give something to her, you can. But ultimately, we want you to know you have our prayers, you have our support, you have our love. And when this is over, I would personally like to be able to come and help with the rebuild Thank and you. do something for you. Because again, I see you as my sister. Thank you. And I hope that will be soon. Let's pray for it to be soon. Let's pray to end. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful woman, for her family, for her church, for everything that they are doing to minister to those in this great time of need. We pray that you will continue to be with them, you will continue to strengthen them, you will continue to lead them in the ways that you see that we don't often see. We pray that you will continue to bring good out of this terrible evil. We pray that you will, at the end, be able to again show your glory and your presence as a result of even something this terrible. Ultimately, we pray for the war to come to an end as swiftly as possible, and we pray for the safety of all those still in harm's way. And we thank you so much for your son who, without him, none of this uh, eternal life and time that we can spend with you in heaven would be possible. And in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.